excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. All right. Is there like a beef with y'all and them? Why is it? Yeah. Is everybody cool? Do I need an altar call? All right. Praise God. Amen. So excited to be in the house of the Lord. Listen, real quick before we get into this, I'm going to open up with um, taking up God's tithe and your offering. I want to I just commend you guys as a church, those who worked and labored, man. We had an amazing Easter last week. Uh, for all of you who labored, worked hard, and did all these things, man, it, it was amazing. I, we got to the point, man, where, you know, all I had to do was preach. And I'm, I'm so excited about that, amen, that God's people are rising up and raising up. To, to take hold of what God is doing, amen, such a blessing. And I will tell you that last week we had the largest service we've ever had, ever, in this building, amen. So that was very, very exciting and encouraging, man, to see what God did in bringing so many people. Um, I'm so excited next week we'll be doing a water baptism. And whoever wants to get signed up for that, amen, because there's was, there was about 28 salvations last week, man, so... Um, we, we want to make sure you get baptized, you know, uh, in water, then baptized in the Holy Ghost and live for God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We're going to go ahead and take up God's tithe, your offering. Amen. Um, you know, the basis of Easter was pretty much, you know, Jesus Christ incarnate, dying, a sacrifice for us, raising again on the third day, defeating death, hell, and the grave, right? None of that would have happened if God didn't first give his son. We would not have had a sacrifice if God had not provided one. In John 3, 16, we know this scripture, if you've been saved in a while, that God so loved the world, so his giving was birthed out of a heart of love, amen? So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, only begotten son. So do we believe that scripture? Do we believe that Jesus Christ came because his father sent him? His father gave him. Well, the Bible says that if we believe this, that we are called to be imitators of God. Ephesians 5, 1 says, therefore, be imitators of God. That means copy him and follow his example as well, beloved children. Amen. So we believe that God is a giver. We are called to imitate the practices of God. And we ourselves are called to be what? Givers. And if we don't believe that, then we can just look at scripture. And scripture tells us to be givers. Luke 6.38 says, give and it should be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. God's word tells us we are called to be givers. God's word also tells us we are called to be tithers. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat or substance in my house. Amen? And he said, see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you are unable to contain. Amen? Another way it says is you won't have room enough to receive what God is pouring out. Amen? So God tells us to imitate him. Amen? He tells us to be givers and tithers, and he also tells us that we are called not to be just hearers, but doers of the word of God. Amen? In James 1.22. So this morning, let's follow the example of the word of God and be givers, tithers, and follow his example in every way. Amen? If you are ready to give of your tithe, your offering, you can do that now. You can lift up your hand. We have our beautiful, wonderful host up here that will give you envelopes for your cash giving or check giving. You can also give through other means and methods up here on the screens. You can text to give. You can go online to thecurechurchls.com and go to our giving portal and give that way as well. But whatever way we're doing it, let's just do it. Amen. Give you a little bit of time to get that ready. We'll pray. There will be an announcement video, and I will get into the word of the Lord this morning. And I am ministering a message called Push to the Finish Line. Come on, we're going to talk about end times this morning. Amen. A push to the finish line. Amen. If you are ready, you can go ahead and stand on your feet this morning. And we're going to pray, and we're going to give joyfully to the Lord this morning, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. 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 Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord Father, that what we give, you first gave us, God. And we follow the examples and the ways of our Savior, of our Lord God, who knows what it is to give. Father, 
you gave your son. The son gave his life. He gave it all for us, God, that we may have ours, God. You died so that we can live, God. You sacrificed it all, Lord God, to benefit us. So, Father in heaven, I pray, let us not be afraid, God, of sacrificial giving in our lives, God. Let us not be afraid of tithing. Let us not be afraid to give when it hurts, God. Let us not be afraid because there's nothing we give, God, again, that you did not give us first, God. And we know that when we give, you give back, Father. You are faithful. You are faithful to the very end, God. So, Lord in heaven, I pray that while we live here on this earth, God, let us live faithful lives to the kingdom of God. We thank you and love you, Lord Father, for the blessing it is to pour into and give into the kingdom of God. We bless you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come forward, amen. Drop off your tithe, your offering, amen, as we have this announcement video. Good morning. Welcome to the Care Church of Lee Summit. My name is Naomi. If this is your first time, we thank you for joining us. These are our announcements. Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we have our midweek service. Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m., we have our next step classes. If you want to learn more about the Care Church or be a part of the team, this class is for you. Every second and fourth Thursday of the month, we have our youth night at the church at 6.45 p.m. Bring your teens out. They will have an amazing time. Care groups are every Friday at 7 p.m. Visit thecurechurchls.com for locations. Saturday morning at 8 a.m., we have corporate prayer. Next Sunday, April 14th at 10 a.m., we have our baptism service. Sign up after service or text 816-367-5500 with the word baptism to sign up. To minimize any distractions, please silence your phones. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Enjoy the rest of service. I was captured by grace so that Jesus Christ could display through me the outpouring of his spirit. I never seen the righteous forsaken. I never seen us begging for bread. That's what the Lord did. When people left us, when they stabbed us in the back, when they talked about us, he has always been faithful. He has always Because offense took his spot, and now you're gonna leave the scene, and the Sunday's gonna come, and that offense you didn't deal with it, and it's still sitting there. And what God wanted to do through you and for you on Sunday, you ain't gonna get it. And it builds, and it builds, and it builds. Ladies, get signed up for that. Women's Conference, amen, with Pastor Jillian from LifeGate and our very own, amen, Pastor Esther Lorke, amen. Co-pastor of the Cure Church in Kansas City. Me and my wife, that's our pastors, amen. It's going to be amazing. Be a part of it. Glory to God. Uh, if you do want to sign up for that water baptism call, lift up your hands. Lift up your other ones. <laughs> You can sign up with Brother Carl right after service. We do have a way you can sign up through text. But if you just want to do it the old school way, go see somebody, go ahead and sign up with Brother Carl right after service. Amen. We just believe in God that, you know, man, lives are going to be changed and transformed. Amen. By this act of obedience. So I'm so excited. Can you stand on your feet with me this morning as we just really just position and posture our hearts on what God wants to do? Amen. Oh. I do real quickly, I do want to also say, man, a happy birthday to my youngest son, yeah. Louis. Yeah. I don't know where he's at, but he just turned 15 today, amen? We celebrated, and then I looked in the mirror like, dude, you're old, man. You are old. My wife's not. She'll tell you. She's not. I am. I mean, oh, man. My kids are 15, 18, and 23. That's wild. Wild to think of. Praise the Lord. Amen. What a blessing. Um, but we're going to pray. And, you know, I'm, I'm ministering this message of push to the finish line. Push to the finish line. You know, in, in cross country, long distance running, you know, my kids have always been in track, all of them. And when I go to track meets and I see them running around in circles over and over again, I get tired. So I'm like, like oof, I need a Gatorade, man. Uh, <laughs> But when I when I I'm, I'm always close to the action. I, I don't want to you know be far away. I want to be close. And when I see like especially the ones that are running the 1600, which is a mile four times around, and and I see the coaches, 
on the sideline. And on that last 100, 125 meters to the finish line, I always hear the coaches say, kick it. Push. Push. You're almost there. You're almost there. you got to dig deep. you got to give it all you got for this last 100 meters. you got to give it all, amen. And, and it's a push to that finish line. Can I tell you something? That is where we are at. We are at the last 100, 125 meters from the finish line. And let me be the coach who will tell you, push. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't give up. I know your legs are tired. I know your lungs are burning. I know it's hard sometimes. But keep pushing. Get to that finish line. I don't care if you're first and I don't care if you're last. I just want you to cross the finish line. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that today, God, would be a reminder that we are called to push, that the end is near, the finish line is before us, God, and now is not the time to get weary. Now is not the time to give up. Now is not the time to throw in the towel. Now is not the time to get offended and hurt. Now is not the time to fall back into the same sin you've delivered us from, God. Instead, it is the time to dig as deep as we ever have before, God. It's time, Lord God, in the midst of our pain that we feel, God, to continue running, crawling, if we must, God, just to pass the finish line. Lord, forgive us for even thinking about giving up. Forgive us for thinking about sinning. Forgive us for thinking, God, about not going another step further. We know that there's an enemy out there who will throw hurdles in our way. Who will throw everything he can at us to give us to quit. Why? Because misery loves company. But Lord, we don't want to quit. We don't want to give up, God. And we're so grateful this morning, God, that we don't have to rely on our own strength to get to the finish line. Where I am weak, Father, you are strong. So give us all the strength we need in the midst of our weakness and fatigue and failures, God. Thank you, Lord God, that we will run and not get weary. Thank you, Father, that you will give us what we need. I pray, God, that you would give me the grace I need, Father, to minister your word to your people, changing hearts and lives, God. Transform us this morning, God. Transform us right here, right now, God. Make us more like you, like we sang earlier, God. I want to be more like you, Father. God in heaven, I pray, anoint me, Lord God, to speak, Lord God, with prophetic giftings, God, with passion and purpose, God. Give me your word, Lord Father. There's things that are not on the uh, iPad, God, that you want to relate to your people. Give me those words this morning, God. Father, bless us. Be with us. Pour into us this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Will you give them the best praise you can right now? I want to ask you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. Amen. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3, all the way down to 44. It says later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 14. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it 
and then the end will come. The day is coming when you see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the stuck religious object that caused his desecration, standing in the holy place. Matthew makes sure to mention these words. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if anyone, so if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will give no light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, a sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Verse 32. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, you will see all these things. You can know this is return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready at all times, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Somebody give him praise for his word. Amen. You can find your seat. We are at a point, church, where you don't even need to be spiritual to be aware of what's going on in the world. You don't have to be spiritual, you just got to be awake. You can no longer oppose or argue the fact that we are getting gloriously and dangerously close to the return of Christ. I say those words purposely because it's glorious for those who are expecting and waiting the return of Christ. It is dangerous for those who don't know him. Today as we sit here in this church building, we are one day closer to the return of Christ. We are one day closer than we were yesterday. And that fact should create an urgency in your spirit this morning. There is just way too much going on right now to continue to be apathetic and lazy in your faith. There's too much going on for you not to come here and pay attention to God's word. There's too much going on to sit here and talk and look at your phone when God's word is going forth. There's too much going on. This morning, I want to take a look at a couple things that are going on right now that should demand our attention. Tomorrow is a solar eclipse. And it's not just another solar eclipse. It is a total solar eclipse, meaning the moon will completely block out the sun. And this will be the first time this has happened since 2017. Do you remember where you were in 2017 when it happened? At that time in 2017, the eclipse followed a path from the northwest all the way through 
the southeastern portion of the United States. In 2017, this eclipse traveled over seven cities by the name Salem. Salem means peace. It's where we get the word of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. There's something monumental about that name. Never has an eclipse crossed over an entire nation before, but not only will it happen again, as it did before, but it's happened seven years apart. We know seven years is monumental in the word of God, seven, which means perfection. Not only that, but the path in which it will cross will create an X over the United States. The center of the X made from the lines of the 2017 and the 2024 solar eclipse are directly over the New Madrid fault line. The path of this new year, totality of the eclipse, which will now go from the bottom all the way up, will cross over, the totality of this will cross over seven cities by the name of Nineveh. You can't make this stuff up. Nineveh represents a people who are called to repent of their great sins. And this is a good thing, you know. Uh, when you look at the X alone, the X alone represents Christ. It represents a grace. It represents a mercy. But who knows that mercy only comes when there's repentance. When Jonah begrudgingly goes to Nineveh, he did not want to go there. He did not like the people of Nineveh. He did not like the Assyrians. He did not want to go there to preach God's word. He fought against God's will. God had to swallow him up in a fish. And spit him out after three days. He finally went and he began to preach repentance to the city of Nineveh. And unknowingly or even him really not wanting to see that happen, he, he'd argue with God, God, you're going to forgive him. I don't, listen, he, he did not have a lot of grace. I'm, thank, I'm thankful that Jonah is not God. And, and as he goes and he preaches, everyone repents. They, they clothed themselves with sackcloth and ashes and they fasted and they repented. And God held back his wrath. This nation is a lot like Nineveh. This nation in which we live, we are a lot like the Assyrians. We need repentance. We need to see God's mercy, but it only comes through repentance. There's wickedness. Perversion, murder, hatred, deception, and division over this nation. Now, before I get any further, I want you to know I, I'm not up here doing some kind of astrology lesson. Astrology is demonic. Amen? This, this is not some conspiracy theory because that ain't me. This is just saying, man, we got to look. We have to see what's going on. And I'm going to tell you why all these things are important. The Bible says there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Prophets like Zechariah and Joel prophesied the sun going dark. Wise men from the east, what do they follow? They follow the stars. There are signs and there are seasons of what God has placed above us. All of these things are happening tomorrow. Now, Pastor, are you saying the Lord's coming back tomorrow? No. No. I truthfully don't even think it'll be the next day or the day after. Because I know there's still things that must take place. But... That doesn't mean that we act like the people of Noah's day. That's why Jesus gave the word. That doesn't mean we keep partying, keep living how we're living. We got time. Listen, even if God don't return tomorrow, you may not live till tomorrow. Don't put all your baskets in. Well, Jesus ain't coming back. You said it, Pastor. Listen, no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows. He, the son said, not even I know the day or the hour. I'm not saying anything. what I'm saying is you got to be aware. You know what else is happening tomorrow? So many things that blew my mind. A comet the size of Mount Everest will be streaking across the same general area as the eclipse tomorrow. Getting close to the sun and this comet has been named Devil's Comet. Or mother of dragons. You know what else is happening tomorrow? NASA is launching three missiles into the direction of the eclipse. The name of the mission, APEP. 
A-P-E-P. Apep is the god of darkness, whose mission, watch this, is to swallow of life. You know what else is happening tomorrow? I ain't done yet. CERN, C-E-R-N, a scientific organization in Switzerland, will be starting their Hadron Collider. This is a 17-mile-long, 300-foot underground tube designed to collide atoms. Why are they doing that? They're doing it in the hopes that the collision of atoms will open up portals to the unknown. Listen, you think it's funny. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm reading, and I'm studying, and I'm like, this sounds like a Marvel movie. Because literally, the, one of their missions is, we believe there's multiple universes. I'm like, didn't I hear that in Spider-Man? <laughs> Something about the multiverse? <laughs> Isn't that a movie? It is what they're trying to do. They're trying to open up port. They want to know what holds the world together. Well, I could have saved them billions of dollars and years of research. <laughs> And told them, I know what holds the world together. I know who holds the world in his hands. His name is Yahweh, Jehovah, God with us, Emmanuel. I mean, you could have gave me that money. Come on. You know how Christians are. You, I would have I planned churches, missionaries. I'm... they're successful in what they're trying to do in colliding atoms, this will have devastating ramifications. They're looking for something also called the God particle. You know, CERN, this place in Switzerland, is located in the territory of St. Genis Pui. In Roman times, this place that they're on right now, the place where CERN is at, was called, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce it, a Apollocaeum. The town and the temple back in Roman times were dedicated to Apollyon, the god of destruction. You have these earthquakes. You have one this past Thursday, which was a 7.2 magnitude in Taiwan. As I'm here at church studying and researching and working on this message, I get alerts. There's another earthquake in New York. In New York! They've not had an earthquake of any kind for over 200 years. And Jesus said, this is just the beginning of the birth pains. The Statue of Liberty was hit by lightning. On top of all this, you have the red heifers. Now, before somebody thinks I'm talking about you, I'm not. Amen. (laughs) They're cows. They didn't find it. Listen. Cindy, listen, calm down. You have the red heifers. You have, I mean, you know, and if I, if I think about this, this is what interests me probably the most. This is probably what took my study the most in studying about these red heifers. Israel became a nation again. Remember, you know, I- Israel was not a nation very long. They were scattered. And it became a nation as prophesied in the word of God that they would become a nation again. They became a nation again in 1948. And since 1948, as they established their nation once again, one thing that was on their heart and mind of many was we need a red heifer to sacrifice. We need one that will be perfect, spotless, blameless in every way. And they've been looking for one ever since. And just recently, a Christian living in Texas had five of them. And those five were shipped to Israel. They're there now. One has become defiled. They have four remaining. And here's why this is interesting. Let me read scripture. Numbers 19, verse 1 through 5, says that the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, here is another legal requirement commanded by the Lord. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer, a perfect animal that has no defects and has never been yoked to a plow. Give it to Eleazar the priest, and it will be taken outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. Eleazar will take some of his blood on his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tabernacle. As Eleazar watches, a heifer must be burned, its hide, meat, blood, and dung. Now, 12 years ago, a rabbi living in Israel, purchased land on the Mount of Olives. We just read 
Matthew 24. Where was Matthew 24 recorded? The Mount of Olives. It's where Jesus spoke to them. We remember on Good Friday when he came into, or Palm Sunday, he came into Jerusalem, remember? And he left. As he left, he went to the Mount of Olives and began to teach more to the disciples about things that were happening before he went into Jerusalem the last time to be crucified. All these things took place on the Mount of Olives. This man purchased land there 12 years ago to prepare for this moment. He purchased this land as a location of the sacrifice. They've already built the altar. The altar is there. They've already built it. The heifers had to be a certain age. They are of age. They've met all the requirements. They have no blemish, no different color hairs. I mean, they, they look at these heifers every day. Feels weird saying that over and over again. They look at these cows. And they look at them every day, and, and they're looking over them. They're looking there. If there's one hair that's not, and it's not like a red like that. But if they find one hair that's white, disqualified. If they find one hair that's black, disqualified. And they, and they think four of them so far are still passing daily tests and observation, looking over them because they're taking this serious. They're taking, because they, these are the Jewish people. They're taking the Torah seriously. And they're looking them over. And, and these are animals that, that have never been worked. I mean, they're, they, no one even leans on them. Or they're disqualified. You can't put anything on them unless it's to protect them or they're disqualified. They've never made it. They've never, they've never uh, uh, worked. They never had a yoke on them. They've, they're perfect in the eyes of what the Torah commands. And this is so close that everyone thought this would happen during Passover this last week leading up to Easter. It hasn't, but this can happen any day now. Now, on top of the heifer <laughs> being perfect, it also requires undefiled priests. Priests who've never have been born in a hospital. Priests who've never been to a funeral or a cemetery. Never been around dead things. They have nine of these priests right now. Let me show you how serious this is. And you think, well, you know, just just the Jewish people doing their thing. Let me show you how serious this is and how it brings a wave of fear to the rest of the world. When Hamas attack Israel back on October 7. They slaughtered 1,200 Israelis or people within Israel. They have hostages even to this day. And when a spokesman for Hamas came up and spoke of the reasons why they attacked Israel, why they did what they did, they listed many reasons. One of the reasons was simply this. Because you plan on sacrificing a red heifer. Look this stuff up. The enemy doesn't want this to happen. And here are the reasons why the enemy does not want this to happen. The Jewish people, when you look at the word of God, they had two temples. The first one was built by Solomon because David couldn't because he was a man of war and it was blood of the saints. His son Solomon built it. That temple that Solomon built was the grandest and it was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire. That happened in 586 B.C. The second, we just talked about this a little while ago, is when Ezra, the priest... Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, all of these were sent back and allowed to go back to Jerusalem and Judah. And they began to build, they laid the foundation of the temple. They established worship once again. But the Bible talks that King Herod was actually the one who came and restructured it and rebuilt the temple. This temple that Jesus was in as he turned over tables. This was one built by King Herod. That temple was destroyed after Jesus' death in 70 AD by Rome. Since then, the Jewish people have not had a temple. Now I'm getting to the reason why the enemy don't want this. The whole reason for the sacrifice, the whole reason they have these four red heifers being guarded day and night, ready for sacrifice. They have the nine priests. All these things are there because the red heifer sacrifice is meant to purify and consecrate them to prepare them. Prepare them for what? To build the third temple. It's getting close. It's getting close. They desire to build the third temple. Now, one of the issues is that when you see Jerusalem in pictures, you always see that thing. Now, here's the issue. The place where they believe that both previous temples once stood is called the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is occupied by that gold thing. That gold thing is the Muslim's Dome of the Rock. So the time that the Israelis and the Jewish people were scattered and left the land abandoned, 
Muslims jumped in there and built that. There's a mosque somewhere around there too. And the Muslims know that if they sacrifice this red heifer, watch this, they know that the Jewish people are not just going to say, well, we'll just build the temple anywhere. You know where the Jewish people want their temple? So the Muslims and the Islamic people know that they're going to want it right there. So what does that mean? Because the Muslim people are not just going to give it away because they believe it's something historic in, into them. But what will happen is this. Most Jews, not all of them, but most Jews in their daily prayers at the Wailing Wall, which is the wall that stands from the last temple, they go to that wall. You know what one of their prayers is? God, let us go to war. It's wild stuff. What kind of war? A war to take back what's ours. Is somebody getting something this morning? This is all biblical. This is all prophetic. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. Now, Daniel's talking about the seven-year tribulation. And he's saying at the halfway point, meaning if you study this, that there's three and a half years of good, and then there's going to be three and a half years of what you don't ever want to see, the worst. And he's saying at the halfway point of this seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist, who, who is he speaking about, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. Now, the first thing to understand is this. How can the Antichrist stop a sacrifice unless there are sacrifices? And at this moment, there are none because there is no temple. So because there's no temple, there's no temple sacrifices. But if they sacrifice this red heifer, if things start going in the direction they want, if war breaks out, they destroy this thing, build up a temple right there, then guess what? This is signaling the end. Now, look what Paul says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion. Stop right there. We're there. The great rebellion part's there. We're, we're there. It's, it's, we got to a point where people are not just saying, I don't want to serve God no more. They're in direct rebellion against God. There are people, man, who are cursing God. There's a great rebellion going on right now. So that part has happened. He says, so it won't happen until first there's a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, which is the Antichrist, the one who brings destruction. Watch this, verse 4. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. So what that looks like is this, from when you look at what Daniel said and you look at what Paul said, this is what it's saying, that the Antichrist will reveal himself. He will come and he will defile the temple. How will he defile the temple? He will put up images of himself in the temple and call himself God. Well, he can't stand in the temple and put an image of himself in the temple unless there is a temple. Now, I do need to put, point this out, that unless they are Messianic Jews, most Jews don't believe in Jesus Christ. For us, we believe that Jesus will build the third temple. We believe it's Jesus who will do all these things. We don't need a red heifer. Because we already have a lamb. That red heifer will not purify us. That red heifer will not make us holy or pure. Jesus Christ did that for us, amen? So while we are standing with our eyes like this, looking for the second coming, the return of Christ, they're still waiting on a first. They believe in the first five books of the Bible. They believe in the prophets. They do not believe in Jesus in the New Testament. 
They believe in that, and they're still waiting. We, we, and it, it's, it's just a flow of what happened even when Jesus did come. The Jewish priests and leaders did not believe in him unless they were Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. They believed in him. But for, as a whole, the Jewish people did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And they still believe the same way now. So even though we don't fall in line with the beliefs of what the Jewish people think, we can't ignore Israel. Israel points to the end time. Israel is a great part of eschatology. We have to look at Israel when it comes to end times, amen? But when we look at all these things, come on, when you look at this crazy eclipse that's going to create an X over the United States, when you look at the Red Heifers, you look at the Third Temple, you look at the Commons, you look at CERN, you look at all these things, we have to know and look. You know, I, I know at times you can say, oh, what a coincidence. That's not one of them. There's too much for it to be considered a coincidence, amen? So what I'm saying is this, all of this is to say this. All of this is to say this. We don't have forever like you like to think. I didn't just stand up here to bring you information about what's going on in the world. I came to give you a word that will change your thinking, that will change your habits, that will get you ready for the return of Christ, amen? Jesus can come back at any time. At any time, knowing that should cause you to pray like you've never prayed before, read like you've never read before, worship like you've never worshipped before. All of this to change your daily habits of who you are in Christ. It should make this, what you're doing right now, more than just some Sunday morning casual thing you do. Just come to do my time and get out of here and go back doing the same stuff I've been doing. We're done with that. We're done with that. You got to live for God. You have to live for God. It is nothing but his grace and his mercy that you're alive up to this moment. You have to live for God, amen? Because the moment you stop making Jesus and church some casual thing while you're doing casual other things, the moment you stop allowing it to be that is the moment your life will change. It's a moment that people's lives who are around you, they will change. Come on, because you have an impact in how you live and what you do. Everywhere we turn, man, there's prophecies being fulfilled that point to the return of Christ. Have you forgotten the pandemic? Pestilences and disease the Bible talks about? Have you forgotten the wars and rumors of wars? The persecution? The people that will hate you? Why? Because of your personality? No, because you live for God. That's the point to the end. That's pointing to the return of Christ. And you think back, man, in the 1776, and you think about when this nation became a nation. You think about the men who signed that piece of paper, the Declaration of Independence, and they lived and they studied and they gave a heart of God. And you think that after all these years, that a nation that was once built upon Christian beliefs, principles, and fundamentals is now a nation that has gradually and more rapidly turned away from God like never before. God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, repent of their sins, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land. I pray all the time, man, for this nation to repent turn away. And you know, if you've been around, you've heard me say before when I gave an account of me, you know, I used to always pray, God, have mercy, have mercy over America, have mercy over America, but I never felt right praying it. I don't know why, I just kept praying it. But then God finally spoke to me and said, how can I show mercy if there's no repentance? How can I have mercy on someone who doesn't want it? He said, I'm looking for the ones who have a broken and contrite heart. So my prayer has been changed. Let this nation repent. Let President Biden repent. Let Kamala Harris repent. Let the cabinet repent. Let everyone in D.C. making these weird laws repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's not only the nation. Can I tell you something? It's also the church. The church needs to repent. Because we made the mistake of trying to fit into the world. We want the world to like us. Where's that in scripture? Where's that in the word of God? Make sure the world likes you. Jesus said, 
They will hate you. They hated me first. Don't worry about it. They hated me first. They'll hate you for what you represent. They'll hate you for what you stand for. But for some odd reason, church leaders in America got to the point of saying, we need to be seeker sensitive. We, we need the world to like us so the world will come to church. But, but here's the problem with that. What change will happen in the world if the church looks like the world? Here, here's where we got it wrong. We've tried to be culturally relevant to the point where the culture and the world has penetrated and permeated the church. So instead of the us, the church impacting the world, guess what? The world impacts the church. We welcome the music, the language. We try to fit in, but God didn't tell you to fit in. God didn't tell us to fit in. He said, you need to stand out. You need to be different. You need to be who I called you to be. We are called the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Amen? So what does that mean to us? That means that we need to not lose our flavor. We need to not lose our flavor. And we can't get bland. We can't get dim. We have to let the world see us. What does it look like to be bland and dim? It means we're just trying to fly under the radar. We're not letting everyone know who we are in Christ. We're not telling nobody nothing. I was, I was thinking about this. Because, you know, the greatest objective to when I witness to people, I mean, I, I would love to someone to say, yeah, I'm a sinner, messed up, jacked up person. Praise God. Let's do it. We can talk now. But the greatest detriment to my witness to someone is this. I, I'm right with God. When you don't see the fruit of their life. I'm not saying being judgmental. I'm just saying, you know deep inside, bro. Sis. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but you just cussed eight times before you said you're saved. Where would we do that at? We do, that's not right. You, you can't say you're saved while you're high. I mean, hopefully this ain't ruffling no feathers in church. I don't agree with that. You need to leave. Because either I get right or I go. You ain't going to cause division in church going around telling people, it's okay, dude, don't listen to me. Leave. And listen, I've had people take little things like that I said and make something big of it. Can I tell you something? I don't care. I don't care. Listen, we're, listen, we're not going to be, any of us will be the ones that go in and sow discord among the brethren. You, you, you can't go around saying you're saved when you're drunk. You can't say you're saved when you're going around fornicating. You can't. I understand people mess up and fall short, but that's where repentance comes from. And repentance means don't, I feel bad, but I'm going to keep doing it. That means I turn away from it, amen? It's time that we begin to stand on what we say we stand on. We can't be dim. We can't be bland. And when people say, well, I'm saved, but you know it's not, then here's the deal. When you're committed to something, you're committed to it. Show me your commitment. When you see commitment, you'll eventually see fruit. And I'm telling you something, man. Like, say, for example, I know of someone you're with, right? Say you have a fiancé. I've not met this fiancé. I've heard of them, but I've not met them. Stay with me. I will only know them when you bring them into my area and say, hey, this is so-and-so. Right? None of us are quiet about our relationships. But why are you so quiet about the most important one you're supposed to have? Because the world knows of him, but until you bring him with you and introduce him to your friends and family, hey, this is Jesus. You smile. This is the one I've been telling you about. I'm so in love right now. i got to introduce. Do you know him? That's how we have to be. It ain't enough that the world knows of him. Can you introduce the world to him? Because he's in your life. And culture penetrates the church. 
the church loses its power. It becomes diluted. It becomes not what the church was supposed to be. And you know what kind of problem this is? It is an end time problem. And the Bible says that we have to begin to be alert. We have to begin to be vigilant once again. Why? Because your enemy, he goes about like a roaring lion. And his purpose is to seek one of you to devour. That is the purpose. He came, the enemy, to kill, steal, and destroy. But God says, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen? Now, now this is a message I am not sharing in an attempt to scare anyone. There should be a fear of the Lord. But I understand something. Fear, fear may get you to the cross, but love will keep you there. Fear ain't going to keep you at the cross. Because you get to the point where you're like, I'm not afraid no more. Like, you know, like Kevin at home alone, I'm not afraid no more. I knew it. I should have stopped when I was there. All right, so listen. I knew it. But fear will only get you there. Love will keep you there. I don't want to make you afraid. I'm trying to make you aware. And the truth is this, and this is, this is the heart of the message when God began to speak to me. When I said, I'm going to do this message. There's too much going on right now, Lord. And I want to do this message. And the, the thing that came to mind, the word that came to my mind is this, the word irresponsible. And it wasn't a rebuke to me for being irresponsible. It's a command that we are called to no longer be irresponsible with the information we are given. And that's what we've done for years and years. We've heard things that were irresponsible. It would be irresponsible for you, for me, to know what's going on, to hear what's going on, and not change. That's irresponsible for us to know. Listen, it'll be irresponsible for me to know I can't swim but jump in the deep end. Help! It will be irresponsible. It would be irresponsible to know that your four-year-old can't drive, yet you give them keys to a car. It would be irresponsible to know what you know and never change. But I'm saying, hey, good, good for you. Are you trying to just do the least you can to get to heaven? Are you trying to do as little as possible, serve as little as possible to get to heaven? Or do you want to go in knowing that I will be rewarded for my labor? That I can have a crown I can lay at his feet. That I don't have to stand before God empty-handed, amen? Maybe we've been foolish. Maybe we've been foolish in how we've lived our lives up to this point. It's time to get serious. I love looking out and seeing so many people, man. I loved on Sunday looking out and seeing us stealing chairs from the kids' room. <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> I love that. But can I tell you something? My goal has never been to just have a big church. Because if that was the goal, I can preach some really easy, goosebump, comfort sermons every week. And I can get a crowd in here. But you know what Jesus did when he did have a crowd? He said, hey, if you're not willing to drink my blood and eat my flesh, you're not going to be a disciple. They all left. Twelve remain. He looked at them. You want to go too? That's what Jesus did. Our goal and assignment, me and my wife, we're not, we're not here to build some big ministry. We're here to build big people. That you could have your relationship with God and grow in God and grow in Christ. That's the goal. The goal is if the rapture happens, we all go. That's the goal. That's the goal. That the rapture happens, we all go. If the rapture happens and only 75% are still here, or 75% are still here, then we failed. We failed. Your job is to retrieve, receive the word of God and live it. Amen? And it's time to stop being foolish in our walk with God. It's time to get serious. It's time to get wise like those five bridesmaids who kept their oil ready and burning. You know, we read Matthew chapter 24. To further illustrate his point in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives this parable. He says this, 
in Matthew 25, verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in to meet with them in the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I do not know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. The purpose of this parable is to show that each one of us are responsible for our own spiritual condition. The parable explains the culture, how weddings were done back in that time. You know, back in the Bible, weddings didn't go in with a Saturday afternoon affair. They were week-long affairs. And in those times, it was the bridemaid who held the responsibility to be waiting for when the bridegroom comes. When the bridegroom comes, they would take their lamps and they would usher him in to receive his bride from, his, from, their, from the bride's home. And would take him, you know, both of them, follow them, illuminate the way to go back to the uh, bridegroom's home. So it was this whole big old thing. And if the groom came, the bridegroom came, and say he was delayed. But they had their oils burning, but he was delayed. It would be a shame if their lamps went out and they were not able to be a part of the wedding celebration. It would be a shame that they were not able to escort the bridegroom in to receive his bride and the bridegroom and bride out as they go to the wedding celebration for the week. It would have been a shame for them. And this is what he's talking about. Because these events took place at night. They needed their lamps to light the way. And each one had to be responsible to have enough oil to keep your lamps burning throughout the night. Our parable says five bought enough oil in case the bridegroom was delayed. Five didn't. Five were shamed and five were commended because you thought enough to have enough oil in case he was late. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that no one knows the day or the hour. Not even him, but the Father in heaven alone knows. It could be now. It could be 20 years from now. And the question is this. Will our lamps still be burning? Will we still have our light burning? Will our lights have run out if God delays another 20 years? Would we have given up and said, listen, I'm done with this all. Let's not be irresponsible. Let's not allow time to cause us to get dull and apathetic. Live a life that's constantly looking for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Challenge yourself as we stand on our feet this morning to live rapture-ready lives. Challenge yourself to get closer to Jesus. Challenge yourself to represent the kingdom of God more than you ever have before. Amen? The first thing we need to do is this. If you're not saved, you're not born again, now is the time to do that. Now is the time to do that. If you're not saved, you're not born again, it's now time to do that. If you're here and you say, that's me, I'm not saved, I'm not born again, I've fallen away, maybe you served God at one time, but you aren't now and you know it, it's time to get right with the Lord, amen? If that's anyone here, I want you to lift up your hand. I would love to pray for you this morning. It would be my honor. I see that hand back there. I see two hands back there. Come on, anyone else? Anyone? I see another hand back there. Come on up. If you, if you lifted up your hand, come on up. I want to pray with you. family? Yeah, bless them. God bless you. God bless you. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Come on, look at this. This is what the kingdom of God is right here. Bring your whole family to the house of the Lord. Amen? Now's the time. Now's the time. No more delay. No more playing games. No more living like the world from Monday through Saturday then coming to church. Live for God. Live for God. Live for God when no one else is watching. Not just on Sundays. Live for God when no one else is watching. I'm going to pray for you guys in a minute. For the rest of us, if you know you're saved, 
But maybe there is a need of repentance. Can I tell you something? I repent all the time. I have to, because I know I deal with pride sometimes. I know I deal with frustration and anger sometimes. I know there's things that my attitude comes out and God don't like it. And I got to step back and say, God, I repent. And I'm being transparent because, listen, I don't want to be fake. I don't want to be a phony. I fall short. But, but here's where the good thing is. When I know I fall short, I don't keep falling short. I take a step back and say, God, I repent for my pride. I repent that I got angry. I repent that whatever. And as believers, that's the life we need to live, a life of repentance. I've been talking to Pastor Jose. He's been calling me almost every day. Pastor, what about he's preaching on the same thing? What about this? What about that? And we're talking. And at the end of the conversation, we always have to say, we just need to be repentant. We need to live repentant lives as believers. Because it's easier to live a repentant life than try to pretend I'm perfect. You're not perfect. And when you understand that, the weight comes off of you. Then you ain't got to pretend. You ain't got to act. You don't have, you know, we're never, we're never going to meet perfection until we meet the perfect one in heaven. So maybe you're here, and you're saved, but you know, I need to repent of some things. You can come to the altar, too. Number three is this. We're not living our rapture-ready lives like we're supposed to. You can come to the altar, too. Whatever it is, man, that we need to get ourselves ready and right for the return of Christ. Amen? Because listen, I want to get, here's the deal, I want to get closer and closer to Jesus as Jesus gets closer and closer to his return. I want to get closer and closer to Jesus as Jesus gets closer and closer to his return. Does that make sense? That's where the urgency kicks in. That's where, the ur- that's where I can't be apathetic no more. I can't be lenient in what I allow. i got to live for God, amen, because God is sending his son back. The Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise. And then those of us who are looking for his return, we will be caught up into the heavens. Daniel says in the end times, there will be an increase in knowledge. There's rockets going off. There's hadron colliders. Jesus said that the preaching of the gospel will go into the, all the world, and then the end will come. We have internet, technology. The word of God can go anywhere in the world right now. we got to live ready, Amen. short. Get on your face before the Lord and say, God, I repent. Not that I just feel bad, but God, I repent. Change me. Transform me. Let me change direction, course in my life. Amen? For you that came up to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to lead you to a prayer. I want you to repeat this prayer after me, okay? But I want you to mean it. I want you to mean what you're about to pray. I'm not going to lead you to some weird thing. It's going to be a righteous prayer. Amen? What you're praying is that you're saying, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. And you're acknowledging that the only one who can save me from my sins is Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to be praying. You guys ready for that? This family, you guys ready? All right. Whoever's up here for that, you ready? I beg of you, do not let this be a moment at 12.05 where you said a prayer and you forget it. Don't let this be, well, I've done it a bunch of times before. Don't let it be one of those, man. Try your best. Lean on God. Lean on others. Live for God. Amen? Repeat this prayer after me. Mean it with all your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of every one of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me in your precious blood. I believe that you died for me and that you rose again on the third day. And on that third day, you defeated death, hell, the grave, and my sin. Come into my heart. Make me a new creation. The old me, the old life, the old nature is done and gone. I am brand new. From this day forward, I will serve you but I need your help. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit that I can be who you want me to be. 
and do what you want me to do. In Jesus' name, I'm yours. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody. Celebrate the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lift up your hands all over this place. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray this prayer, God. We're admitting we're sinners. We're admitting we need a Savior. Father, come in. Come in, God, and change us from the inside out. Change and transformation will never happen from the outside in, God, because it's not about what you look like on the outside. It's what you've done in us on the inside. So, Father, today, Lord God, I pray, give each one of us, God, from the front to the back, to the left to the right, God, teachers that are back here, God, who ain't even here right now, but, God, give us the strength and the fortitude we need, God, in these last days and last hours to truly live for you, Lord. Father, to stop playing games, to stop playing games, God, to know, Lord God, where we fall short and say, God, help me. Help me in this area of my life, God. Help me to look like you, be more like you, talk like you, act like you, God. Help me, Lord Father, to lay aside, God, every weight, every sin that so easily ensnares me. Lord, I lay those things aside this morning. I lay every hindrance aside right now, God. And I pray, Lord, fill me up. Say that prayer, Lord, fill me up. Fill me up because, Lord, we've been filled with so many bad things, things of this world, God. So, Father, we pray that today, Lord God, you would fill us up until we overflow with the power and the goodness of our God. Lord, in heaven, everything we do, Lord God, let us look to you. I even pray, Lord God, bring forth, God, not a condemnation, but a heavy conviction. Anytime we even think of doing something we shouldn't be doing, God, let a conviction overwhelm us, God, so deep that we won't even want to do what our flesh wants, God. Bring us that conviction, that holy conviction, God. We know that the enemy comes to condemn, but Lord, you come to convict. Holy Spirit, convict us of our sin, God. We pray this right now, God, and we pray let that conviction bring us to repentance. Let it bring us to our knees, our face before the Lord, God, crying out, God. So Lord, help us. Father, we thank you that you are so gracious and so merciful to give us this moment in time, God, that we can say, Abba, Father, forgive us. Because we know you're coming. So many people have not had the privilege of crying out to you, Lord God, before they left their, met their demise. But Lord, you've given us this moment right here, right now, God, to put, put a line in the sand and say, I'm on this side. I'm living for God. I'm not doing what my flesh wants. I'm living for the one who saved me. Lord, you're in here coming near. Let your people be ready. Let us all be ready, God. Let us all be ready for the return of our Savior. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Will somebody pray for him right now? You know, the Bible says that today day of salvation. That's something we celebrate, man. Today's the day. The day of the day. Amen. That we just walk in oneness and fullness with Christ our Savior. I said it before. I'll say it one more time, man. Don't let this be a casual thing. Don't let this moment you come to this altar and say this prayer. Don't, don't let it be some casual thing. Because it'll change your life. I did the same thing you've done and it changed my life. It changed my life. And it can do the same thing in yours. I ain't no different than nobody else at this altar right now. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen. I don't know, man. I don't want to be like, hey, let's celebrate the Lord. Walk out. I want to celebrate the Lord, but I want to live it. Live this life. Serve God. Amen. If you get anything, man, listen, mature church, we believe Jesus is the cure for everything. For everything, your marriage, your health, your life, your purpose, everything, Jesus is the cure. Live for him, amen? We love you guys. We love you guys. Take hold of the crown of pride and say, it's yours, Lord. Stay close to him. Let's get closer to this throne, amen? Let's give him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus.
for God. Simple as that. Go and live your life for God. You're at this altar, go. Live for God. Leave these four walls of this building and go live for God. Go home, live for God. And what you watch on TV, live for God. What you do at work tomorrow, live for God. You got to get rid of some friendships, live for God. Do whatever it takes to live for God. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. We are dismissed.